Good evening, everyone. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Friday, July 6, 2012. Here's a look what's coming up. Tonight, warning shots will not be fired. Army manual outlines plan to kill rioters and confiscate constitutionally protected firearms. We also cover TSA's new policy, ordering travelers to freeze on command. And Aaron Dyke sits down with John Loftus, author of America's Nazi Secret, to discuss the ties between the U.S. government and the Nazi regime of World War II and what it means to us today. All this, plus a special video from Alex Jones on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. So as you can see, we have another jam-packed and informative show lined up for you this evening. But we begin tonight with a newly leaked U.S. Army military police training manual for what they are calling civil disturbance operations. The Army manual outlines the plan to kill rioters and demonstrators in America. That's right. They have plans to confiscate our firearms and kill American citizens on U.S. soil. This during a mass civil unrest, which of course will be engineered by the foreign banks who now run our military. Warning shots will not be fired. Use of deadly force authorized. And this of course is the top story right now on Infowars.com. The PDF document, which is dated in 2006, well it was used for a self-learning course at the U.S. Army Military Police School at Fort McClellan, and it makes it clear that operations apply to both inside and outside the continental United States. The document outlines how military assets will be used to restore and maintain law and order by shooting protesters, I guess, shooting innocent civilians, perhaps. And it goes on to describe how prisoners will be processed through internment camps. Wow. So there you have it. Our own military being trained for armed conflict with U.S. citizens. They're being trained to confiscate our guns and preparations to process us into camps during civil unrest. And we are now joined by Dan Fight, who is an investigative journalist for HongPong.com. He's also a uh, graphic artist and web designer. And you initially broke the story, and I was, I was wanting you on today. I was wondering if you could briefly go over the document and tell us how you got your hands on it to begin with. Yeah, I mean, uh, all the credit is really due here to a really excellent website called publicintelligence.net. They do a really good job uh, systematically finding uh, obscure and limited access files from uh, within the U.S. military and other institutions. Um, I just saw it pop up uh, yesterday and uh, quickly wrote a summary of it for my own site to get that distributed and out there. Um, essentially, uh, this uh, document ties to a number of other documents which I've been involved in researching uh, in my uh, personal experience, I covered the 2008 Republican National Convention and uh, the 2009 uh, G20 conference in Pittsburgh um, through the G Infinity Media uh, Center that was independent media that was put together. And so uh, what we have here is a system of expanding, um, you know, emergency use of domestic military personnel. Um, and at one level uh, that I found the research on earlier, uh, there's something called a CON Plan 3502, Civil Disturbance Operations Concept of operations plan run by the U.S. Northern Command, and uh, that was what we found earlier, and uh, public intelligence uh, has also helped pull together some other documents from that, and so what we found here was essentially the military police training document to instruct the military police in a number of different uh, important aspects of uh, this general domestic operations uh, planning, including uh, domestic uh, searches without warrants. Uh, there's only, there's no reference to warrants or those type of constitutional rights in this. Um, this also includes uh, various aspects of uh, crowd control, area control, uh, riot control, and uh, some really kind of terrifying statements about how uh, military-operated detention facilities inside the United States would uh, be protected by lethal force, including the statement that warning shots will not be fired in the event that someone is trying to escape. As soon as they 
deem a risk of lethal injury, they're just going to shoot you. And uh, it's, it's helpful to have these things on, on paper and concrete to establish uh, the different levels of this uh, planning structure. And I think that what we're going to see um, at the Republican and Democratic National Conventions later this year, which are national special security events, uh, we're going to see very similar planning frameworks activated that are very uh, reminiscent of this. And this document is from April 2006. It was used at the Fort McClellan, Alabama, U.S. Army Military uh, Police School. And um, I would presume there's probably been a few tweaks to this document since then. And I was able to find an earlier version of the document from uh, many, many years before. I think it was from the 80s. Um, so this has been revised before. Um, and in the, there's a lot of continuities. It involves a lot of stuff about troop formations, certain riot control weapons, uh, things like that. As well as uh, it, it talks about how uh, a task force uh, domestically would have its own psyops unit. And uh, psychological operations, I believe, are not legal for the U.S. military. Well, to let me let me stop you right there for a second because I thought that was m one of the more interesting the whole thing is interesting and I'm still combing through it you know I just uh, got access to it today but it talks about internment camps where internees will be re-educated okay this they talk about into developing an appreciation of <laughs> of US policies mm -hmm. so um, what does that mean I mean so uh, if you and I don't agree with US policies we're out there protesting how are they gonna re-educate us yeah. Um, I, I think that's uh, the earlier document that you're talking about that was uh, more specifically uh, in detail to the management of the detention facilities, which, uh, you know, surfaced a few months ago. This one is a little bit more general than that. It doesn't go quite to that. It mainly has to do with saying this is our escalation of force inside the detention facilities. It, I, it, as, I didn't notice anything about it getting to the uh, re-education of people, but it, it does get to the uh, degree of force that will be enabled. And uh, it also talks about how uh, uh, things like gasoline, uh, firearms can be restricted. And I think what we saw during Hurricane Katrina, um, which happened right around the same kind of time as this was released, that the military was behaving in much the same way. They were attempting to seize firearms from people without Fourth Amendment uh, warrants and procedures, and because probably they were trained as military police to not worry about the Fourth Amendment in, in terms of things like firearms. It also gets a lot to uh, uh, military intelligence, uh, analyzing protest groups and, and things of that nature. Um, so it, it's really a, uh, at a broad kind of like ground level, you know, sort of grunts, uh, MPs, like this is how in the situation of large riots, this is what we would do. And so in the 1990s, during uh, the LA riots, um, the old plan, which was called the Garden Plot, which was Con Plan 3502's predecessor, um, would have entailed uh, training uh, very similar to this in terms of how they were, uh, you know, trying to manage crowds and that kind of thing. And so uh, I think what people need to look at if they're trying to research into this is what are the parameters of this intelligence uh, situation when they're going to collect intelligence? You know, this doesn't talk about advanced agencies like the Defense Intelligence Agency or the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which does a lot of, you know, kind of compiling of data together. And um, I, I just think that uh, this, while this shows uh, a very certain heavily militarized tactics, it shows, you know, when they line up people that are suited up as riot police, these are the psychological tactics to intimidate protesters and that kind of thing, um, as well as, again, uh, run detention facilities that are patrolled with lethal force. Um, well, and, and I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the document right now, definitely a show of force, intimidation, primary function of the military will be breaking up unauthorized gatherings, they're going to be uh, patrolling the streets, uh, they're going to be looking for any disturbance areas, uh, prevent lawless acts, they, uh, I wonder what they consider an unauthorized gathering, you know, I mean, this, right. this is crazy, uh, military forces will be present uh, to show, uh, like I said before, a show of force intimidation. They will mm -hmm. establish roadblocks, which they're already doing in California, by the way, to stop mm -hmm. drunk drivers. And they will break up crowds, employ crowd control, uh, conduct street patrols. And, um, you know, I mean, this is scary stuff. I mean, yeah. tell us about some of the deadly force and the non-lethal force. What kind of weapons will they be using? Well, I mean, essentially they're authorized to, um, you know, what they say is defend themselves or defend against serious...
you know, elements of what they call critical infrastructure, which could be any like large corporations or banks or that kind of thing. It, it's a real, uh, a broad spectrum of things which they're, you know, essentially authorized to use force under. But what's frustrating about these documents is that they, they really are clearly not written in reference to constitutional government or limited government at all. Like there's no uh, representation of the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, uh, you know, for searches, uh, the right of people to you know possess firearms well, and civil because emergencies, it's martial law you know? because it's right. martial law everything's out the window yeah 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 and this there are direct references to the phrase martial law in this exactly. document they say that well only under curfew could the military under federal control really under only under martial law could they impose a curfew but we will definitely support local official officials when they're running curfews so everything that's sort of like underneath a full-scale martial law like this is the kind of pattern and the kind of information which uh, you should review and have a good sense of whenever you feel like you might encounter, uh, you know, any military uh, acting domestically, even if it's not a, a full-blown, complete martial law scenario, they're still going to kind of be acting along this pattern, you know, again, as we saw in Katrina. So as we want to try to get an understanding of these things, um, as well as hopefully intervene politically and, and get these kinds of things revealed and out in the open and, and not secret, I mean, I think personally, if we're in detained in military facilities, like this thing lays out, we do deserve warning shots. Like, could we demand that from our congressional representatives? <laughs> you know, we have to basically look at how to reform these policies, as well as obviously, you know, showing everybody, the public elected officials and everyone, and, you know, good people in the military and, you know, uh, bureaucracy. Well, and that's too, it. That this that's isn't it. okay. That's this exactly right, right there. The we need to get this information out to all our friends and family who are in the military. Um, because, you know, our military is waking up to this as well. It, they're starting to come to the realization that they are working for the offshore banking cartels who run them and who are turning them against their own people. So, and I, and I for one, have friends who are uh, in active military as both of veterans, and they're simply not going to stand for it. So, in closing, uh, anything else you'd like to add before we go? Oh, uh, you know, I just think that everybody, you know, can do this kind of research. A lot of primary source stuff comes out. Uh, sites like publicintelligence.net and uh, cryptome.org is another really good one. You find a lot of really excellent gems, and then people need to pick these things apart, pass them around, start finding new ones, and start trying to suss out new sources, because they're trying to clamp down on leaks, uh, you know, right now as fast as they can and build a much tighter secret government. And it's really important for all of us to work against that, because we can clearly see from this kind of documents that uh, the planning is not really congruent what we think of uh, you know as an open society as a limited constitutional government we can clearly see that's not the way that these kind of things tend to be set up that's right hey before we go I almost forgot to ask you uh, you're the one that brought this to our attention the DRE program in Minneapolis where the uh, police officers at Occupy Wall Street uh, protest events they were giving illicit drugs reportedly to uh, teenagers whatever happened to all yeah. that well, I, essentially, um, I worked with a you know a significantly large group of people from several different organizations to help bring that news forward. The accounts of people that were given drugs and uh, offered drugs to become informants and that kind of thing. Um, it prompted a very large uh, national discussion about similar things happening, similar tactics, uh, drugs being used in informant contexts. So I think that was. Uh, helpful to uh, raise awareness that that type of tactic exists. However, um, on the local level and the state level here, um, people like the FBI and the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension have been asking questions. Um, a, a few fingers got pointed when uh, one officer stepped forward and said, yes, this was going on. But since then, they've tried really, really hard to bury it. Uh, they just want to pretend that it never happened. They want to forget that all of this happened. But that's not going to work. People are going to keep pressuring them to spit out the truth, uh, you know, come to their final reports and then get some reform at the legislature because the underlying DRE program itself is kind of ridiculous. It uh, is used to just basically deem that people are intoxicated based on certain physiological symptoms that are not substantiated. So even on that level, the program is ridiculous. And I could predict that people are going to want to uh, intervene further against this thing. Well, and thanks to you for bringing attention to the, you know, to the public. Otherwise, who knows what would be going on. So, hey, Dan Fight, thank you for joining us once again. Keep us posted on any developments on the training manuals, all that stuff. It's good to have you uh, on our side, and we look forward to talking to you again. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be with you. All right, take care. All right, once again, our top story on Infowars.com. 
Army manual outlines plan to kill rioters and demonstrators in America. You can download the PDF document and see it for yourself. Also, Kurt Nimmo has added a detailed report about the document's plans for gun confiscation. Again, all this information breaking right now on our website. And at the beginning of that interview, you know, I've got so many of these documents are being released, it's really hard to keep track of all these. But we're talking about the re-education camps. This is a related document that was also recently released. A leaked U.S. Army document prepared for the Department of Justice, excuse me, Department of Defense, contains shocking plans for political activists to be pacified by PSYOP officers into developing an appreciation of U.S. policies. So there you go. Those uh, people will be de detained in prison camps inside the United States. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, a helicopter strike blasts an Afghan man to pieces while the pilot sings Bye Bye Miss American Pie. The video is actually on LiveLeak.com. It appears to be from an Apache helicopter. Let's take a look. Bye-bye, Miss American Pie. Good hit. Nice. Now, according to the, the caption on the website, the victims were innocent farmers who were planting poppy seeds in the middle of the road. So there's, uh, you know, that is yet to be verified, but we'll keep you updated on that. Now, more TSA news. As Lee Rockwell recently broke a story of yet another bizarre power trip by the TSA as a new policy allows them to order travelers to freeze on command. And if you think this uh, bizarre power trip behavior of the TSA couldn't get any crazier, think again. The federal agency is now ordering travelers that they, uh, well, the ones passing through security, they now have to freeze on command. And we just recently reported yesterday how they're also demanding to test drinks purchased by passengers after they have already gone through the naked x-ray scanners and the grope downs. So even once you go through all that, and let's say you stop at McDonald's, I wouldn't do it, but let's say you do, get a Coke or an iced tea, then the TSA, they want to come test your drink even after you've gone through all that. So this is, this is basically prisoner training. This is a preparatory state to get you used to, you know, people in uniform yelling at you, getting you used to people in uniform filling you up, filling your children. And, uh, you know, the police state is not coming, folks. It's already here. Up next, Rand Paul, uh, after blasting the Senate last week for passing a 600-page bill that obviously nobody has had time to read, uh, Senator Rand Paul introduced legislation that could force the Senate to actually read the bills. Well, there's an idea. He introduced legislation that would force the Senate to give its members one day to read bills for every 20 pages they contain. So it sounds like a good idea. I guess it looks good on paper. It's about time that we actually require them to actually read the bills but at this point, I'm not sure what difference it's going to make. I mean, seriously, if you think about it, even if, let's say, uh, the Congress and the Senate had time to read, for example, the Patriot Act, I'm sure they would have passed it anyway because they no longer represent the people. They work for the corrupt, well, the offshore banking cartel that control them and the president. So uh, thank you, Rand Paul, for introducing that legislation, but you're going to have to do better than that. All right, up next, uh, did you hear about this? This is a couple days from now, you might lose access to the internet. And that is because the FBI plans to shut down temporary DNS servers that replaced fraudulent servers operated by hackers. So this will be a blackout in response to the DNS changer Trojan. That was the malware program that basically paralyzed the functioning of all kinds of websites. Looks like some 360,000 internet users are still using the rogue servers, so you might lose access to the internet on Monday if you're one of those people, but it's only temporary. But no doubt the authorities want to use this 
hacking incident as another excuse to take total and complete troll, complete control of the web. So, hey, we have Joseph Farah news. Now, Joseph Farah was recently on the Alex Jones show just yesterday, and you know he's the World Net Daily editor, and he's a big time critic of the Obama administration. And he's on his property in Northern Virginia, and lo and behold, he looks up in the sky over his uh, tree line, and he sees a drone. He said it sounded like a lawnmower, because he lives in one of the most rural, secluded places that you could possibly live in, in Northern Virginia. And there could be only one thing that the drone was spying on, and that was Joseph Farah. So why would they want to spy on him? Well, here's a clip from the Alex Jones Show just yesterday. Let's take a look. What do you expect the power structure to do? Uh, because in my view, uh, in my analysis, their credibility is draining away. I mean, how many armored vehicles, how many hollow point bullets, how many helicopters, how many drones, how many SWAT teams? I mean, we know the system knows we don't like them and that they have a 9% approval rating in Congress. And their answer is, we're going to arm to the teeth against you and say that mom and apple pie and George Washington are terrorists. That's right. Well, you know, I think like you, I, I have a, a, lot, a lot of optimism because I have a lot of faith not necessarily in the majority of the American people anymore, but in a very, very healthy segment of the American people who are not going to take this stuff laying down. By the way, Alex, remember when you were in my office uh, in uh, Virginia, um, one, one of my crew asked if you had ever seen a drone, and you answered, no, you hadn't. I get back home within a week or two of that conversation. I'm taking my dog for a walk, and guess what I see? right over the tree line, right above my head, is a drone. <laughs> Incredible. So, so <laughs> if anybody calls you crazy, Alex, for talking about the drones, you can just send them my way, and <laughs> because I've seen it with my own eyes. I only wish I had my cell phone camera uh, to uh, get a picture of it. That's why I haven't said anything about it publicly before. Now, how high was it? Was it a low? Oh, it wasn't high at all. And, you know, I, I didn't even know, I, I, at first I, didn't even, I couldn't even make out what it was because it had such a weird sound. It sounded like there was a lawnmower over my head, and it, it looked like nothing I had ever seen before. So I immediately jump on the Internet, and I start looking up drones, and I'm seeing things that resemble what I saw. And one of the characteristics I saw described was it can sound like a lawnmower over your head for crying out loud. So that was my confirmation <laughs> that for some reason, and then I later found out that in Northern Virginia here, they had, they, even the police departments are using drones. And now they want to arm them, and all over the country they've been using them for surveillance. We found the EPA documents were in 2009 they were doing it, and, and, and they ran a national story saying InfoWars ran a hoax, Drudge picked it up, so did World Net Daily, all these other evil publications, hundreds of articles, nightly news shows, media matters, what a joke. And then they played a straw man because the article we wrote also linked to a local story in the Dakotas where they were, and other states where they were complaining about calling them drones because they just arrested those cattle rustlers, uh, alleged cattle rustlers, using a predator. But then they conflated it, mixed it in with the EPA Cessnas they're using to spy on farmers. The point is, they're spying with everything, and they spun it with a straw man that we'd made it up when they're announcing 30,000 of them in the FAA budget in the next decade. You see, it's talk like that that'll apparently get unmanned drones sent to your property. And uh, well, now it appears that drones are targeting journalists who oppose the Obama administration. Looks like target practice to me, but uh, I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to our quote of the day. This one by Adolf Hitler. Without law and order, our nation cannot survive. That was Adolf Hitler. Did you know that Hitler only had one testicle? Honestly, it's a, a historical fact. You can look it up, and I like to point it out every chance I get. So uh, anyway, that's going to do it for the first half of the show. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Aaron Dykes is joined by Emmy Award-winning author John Loftus. They're going to discuss his book, America's Nazi Secret. You don't want to miss this interview because they're going to talk about 
the CIA recruitment of Nazi war criminals. This was during, of course, the aftermath of World War II, as well as the modern recruitment of Muslim extremists and how the U.S. Justice Department concealed this information from the 9-11 investigators. A powerful interview with John Loftus right after this. Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at Infowars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure, but if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. Hi, I'm Christy Hightower, site moderator on Planet InfoWars, here to let you know how patriots like you are talking this week. Have you ever thought about the greatest risk to civilization biologically referencing? Well, user Rosso has, and in his article, The Greatest Biological Threats to Civilization, he references something like 20 different known biological threats, anthrax, cholera, uh, Ebola, different things like that. He gives you fatality rates, symptoms, uh, how it affects, how it would affect you. Um, and these are just the ones that we know about, much less ones that might already be developing against us. Then there's an article by In Like Flint, The Universe, Ancient Astronauts in Atlantis. He starts by telling you a story from his childhood, how his, his, his fascination with aliens from above coming down and, and giving us technology from ancient civilizations ago, and how the in the know now are holding this information, withholding it from us. So that being said, it leads me into our last article, Food Stamps, President Obama Wants You on Food Stamps. This is actually a great article um, for, for many reasons. Melissa Melton is actually one of the reporters from the reporter contest. And this article was featured on the InfoWars homepage, and it's still a featured article. She talks about how a skyrocketing food stamp usage during Obama's presidency, something like 100%. She gives great references. She is well-spoken and had a great response to her article. So that being said, we are looking out for great articles, well-written, well-referenced. So keep up the good work, you patriots out there. And that being said, also, some other things on Planet InfoWars, you can find the deal of the day, like in the Fed t-shirt. We had that on sale for $12.95 in the sidebar, and that's only on Planet InfoWars. Other things like, like groups that you can join, get active, create missions, meet people in your, in your local area. So keep up the good work. We are paying attention, and thank you so much, patriots. Till next week. And we are back from break on the InfoWars Nightly News. Thanks to Darren McBreen for covering the news portion. Tonight we're joined by a special guest. He's the author of America's Nazi Secret. Is John Loftus, probably the foremost expert into all the financier connections on the American and British sides with the funding of the Nazis in World War II and everything that happened afterwards. He will help set the record straight and we'll get deep into history. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Loftus. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, could you first tell us about your background, everything you did as an attorney, as an intelligence officer, and, and what kind of things you're working on now? Sure, I was an Army officer, then I went to law school and was hired by the Attorney General of the United States, and I worked at the headquarters of the Justice Department. And because of my intelligence background, I had very high security clearances, many levels above top secret. Uh, I worked on the CIA cases and the Nazi war crimes cases until one day somebody got the bright idea of assigning me to see if there are any Nazis hiding in America 
and I found out they were. They were on the CIA payroll. But the CIA didn't know they were Nazis. Um, our State Department and the British Secret Service had dumped Nazis here. And when it turned out that it was a bit of a Cold War blunder, the British intelligence agent that was sending us Nazis to spy on Russia was himself a communist agent. So instead of getting anti-communist freedom fighters, the dregs of the Nazi war criminals were being sent to America. And we had two CIAs, one that worked for the Republicans, in, hidden inside the State Department, and one that worked for the Democrats. You see, no one ever thought that Truman would beat Dewey, and they had already hired the Nazis when Truman was reelected. So at this critical point in Cold War history, we actually had two intelligence services, two CIAs, one that hunted Nazis, the CIA, and one that recruited them, the OPC, the State Department. And that division has continued in American foreign policy as well as intelligence policy over the last half century. So I'm sort of a, a specialist in uh, the Mission Impossible crowd, the, the ones where the secretary will disavow any knowledge of their actions. And basically, <laughs> these guys were bankers. They were in it for the money. Right. So when we get into the whole history of the CIA, that goes back to a lot of the Wall Street bankers. Many of them were skull and bones who helped set up the National Security Act. Uh, people like Harriman, the wise men, working with people like Dulles. Uh, where do you see all this converging around World War II? Well, it's funny. People don't realize that some of America's finest families funded Hitler. There's going to be a documentary coming out called American Secrets sometime this year or next. And it focuses on those families like the Harrimans and the Walkers and the Bushes. That, you know, people only know that uh, President Kennedy's dad bought some Nazi stocks. And people don't know that he bought them from Prescott Bush. They both went to Germany on the same ship before the war. So there were Americans who poured a lot of money. In fact, one of the causes of the Great Depression might have been the relocation of American investment capital from companies like Brown Brothers Harriman, where the, the Rockefellers had their money parked. And they moved that money to buy stock in German companies. And it was supposed to be a great big bargain. Germany had a high-tech monopoly in the 30s. But unfortunately, you know, Hitler came to power, and instead of being a dog on a chain to keep the anti-communists and the labor unions at bay, Hitler seized control of the New York investors' funds. And from then on, they had a choice. They could either expose Hitler, or they could collaborate with Hitler and try and save their money. And sadly, most of these people became traitors. During World War II, some of America's finest families gave aid and comfort to the enemy. They kept financial assistance to the Third Reich going on all during World War II. But hadn't they even before that set up the eugenics regime, a uh, partnership between the Anglo factions, the Rockefellers had supported the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, uh, all this had moved over to Germany along with the industrial machine. So the financing really met with a lot of uh, very serious foreign policy and, and kind of private partnership agendas. Well, I think what you have is, and I don't want to overstate the case, there were some wackos with a lot of money who thought that eugenics was a serious movement. And, and they believed in racial superiority and that those who had money were obviously racially superior, ignoring the fact that they inherited their money from mommy and daddy, who sometimes had done very despicable things to acquire the family funds. Um, the eugenics movement was, you know, it's so colorful, I think, that it distracts attention, and people look for a great conspiracy. You know, when sharks swim in parallel lines, they're not conspiring together. They just all smell blood in the water and are racing to get there first. What we have was, a, was an awful lot of very rich and very greedy Americans, Republicans and Democrats, but mostly Republicans, who thought that Hitler was the way to make a lot of money because he would allow them to have 
cartels, monopolies, and trusts that were forbidden under American law. Right. But, uh, you know, these guys had worked out a loophole uh, called the Webb Pomerine Act of 1918, where they could set up trust monopolies and cartels overseas. And some of them invested in Bolshevik Russia, and some invested in the nascent Nazi Party of Germany. Well, the Russian investment didn't go so well, but the German investment looked like it was going to pay off in spades. Nobody thought America would ever go to war against Hitler. In fact, it was Hitler who declared war on us, not the other way around. Sure. So uh, going to the post-war period, leading up to the Nuremberg trials, you say they were fixed. Uh, can you lead us up to, you know, what all was going on with that, the role of uh, the Justice Department here in the United States and covering up all the Nazis who had been shipped in, and talk about Operation Paperclip. Sure. After uh, Dewey surprisingly lost to Truman, the spy service inside the State Department was in a rough place. And they worked with the Justice Department on a cover-up. The Justice Department was in this up to their eyeballs. They knew that Nazi intelligence agents were being brought into America illegally. And, uh, you know, a lot of attention has been paid to the Nazi scientists. And it's colorful, but you missed the big picture. What you don't realize was that the British intelligence officer helping us recruit these Nazi scientists was a guy named McLean. Donald McLean was Kim Philby's best buddy. He was also a communist agent. So instead of getting the Nazi scientists who could actually build rockets, we got the Nazi bureaucrats. We got the guys who were war criminals, guys like Arthur Rudolph, who used human beings as if they were disposable chemicals. He had these underground caves where they assembled the V2 rockets. Uh, Werner von Braun, you know, very patronizing bureaucrat. But what happened is uh, the British made sure that the best of the Nazi scientists went to Moscow. That's why Sputnik came out first. And all we got were the scientists that kept exploding rockets on the pad. The same thing, the sad thing is President Harry Truman had explicitly forbidden this. He had ordered that the military could never recruit any German who was a voluntary member of the SS, who was wanted for war crimes, or had a low Nazi party number. And the army said, oh yes, Mr. President. And they lied to their teeth. The this army and the State Department fixed the records so that these German scientists could come to America. And it was a hilarious farce. You know, it, when Kim Philby finally defected to Moscow, um, all the State Department could do was, was bury the files. Until 50 years afterwards, I, I stumbled across them. I was the first American to go into these underground vaults and, and look at the records of what really happened at the beginning of the Cold War, back when America had two spy agencies. And what the State Department, and guys like Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles had done, was beyond despicable. The Dulles brothers wanted to cover up for the American clients who had invested in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And they did that by saying that, well, we use Nazi intelligence officers to spy on Russia, and it's all hush-hush. And that's how they shut down all the money laundering investigations. And it turns out that the money was being moved, and this embarrasses me as a Roman Catholic to say, the money was being moved to the Vatican. It was the one bank in the world that had diplomatic immunity. And the Vatican Bank would move the money out of Europe to Latin America and then back to West Germany for the great economic revival of West Germany. Sure. And all it was was that, you know, like Chase Manhattan Bank, the Rockefellers, they were just getting their money back if they had invested. And respectful, respectively, the Vatican had also uh, been part of the rat lines and shipping Nazis to foreign countries as well. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't just ship the money out. You know, because the Nazis who were left behind would complain about it, so they had to devise a way of doing that as well. So here's the tragedy. I have friends who are, you know, very old men now, who were Nazi hunters inside the U.S. Army, and they burglarized the Vatican's uh, rat line, the, the, the smuggling system, and found out how it was going. 
and the State Department ordered them hands off. And I had that in writing. So, uh, yeah, it was one of the most despicable things that our State Department had ever done. I was astonished. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, can you get more into the cover-up? How many documents have been destroyed and leaked and lost and covered up and kept under secrecy? And, and how did you get access to them? Well, you know, the, the funny thing is you can't really destroy top-secret files because there's too many copies. And any time you want to destroy a top-secret file, you have to make records of its destruction. So the best thing to do is misfile them. So they dump the Nazi records out in the vault where the nuclear secrets were stored. So I was a, a newly appointed Nazi hunter. I thought I'd get a free trip to Germany out of it. I knew nothing about the subject. But because I had all these super high security clearances, I needed them to get into the vaults. There are 20 vaults underground at Suitland, Maryland. Each vault is one acre in size. And, and top secret won't even get you close to getting inside. You need much, much higher. So I was the first guy in a half a century who had every security clearance under the books. I was the only one who could go to the index in Vault 2 and find out that there was a Nazi file on someone and then go down to Vault 6 and read that he had been recruited by the State Department. So I spent two years uh, going through the classified files of every U.S. and NATO agency. And I was appalled at the incompetence. We actually had one American spy agency inside the State Department that lied to all the others. And it really wrecked American security. We actually had a, a, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Shakish Kavili, um, and he didn't know that his own daddy was a Nazi war criminal. We couldn't even do basic security checks. That's how much damage our State Department did. Those guys, I'm not saying they should have been hung, but they should have been prosecuted and gone to jail. The guys who should have been hung were the people like Alan Dulles that helped Hitler during the war and then covered it up afterwards. Can you elaborate on his role during the war? Yeah, Alan Dulles was the... American intelligence chief in Switzerland during the war. And 40% of the wartime supplies for the Third Reich moved through Switzerland. And these supplies have been bought and paid for by Dulles's American clients and some British clients. So Dulles was sort of a double agent. Uh, he was supposedly working for the Americans to get intelligence on Germany. But at the same time, he was really mostly working for the Nazis to protect his clients' investment, to launder the funds, if you will. And he was very good at that. So if you look at all the behind-the-scenes stuff going on with, with the networking and the money that was there, what becomes the real narrative of World War II? Why, why were we fighting? Uh, was justice served and who won the war? What, you know, what happened at Nuremberg? How many people were really prosecuted compared with the real Nazi apparatus? And how many people got away? You see what I'm sure. asking? Now, world War II was a, you know, a righteous war if there ever was one. I mean, you know, Hitler and Nazism and their cruel racist doctrines uh, had to be stopped. I mean, it wasn't a question really of a choice. Hitler would have kept on invading one country after another until somebody stopped him. Mm -hmm. And the British said no, and we agree with the British that, that this time this man had to be stopped. Um, the corruption didn't really come on the American side until much later. We were Boy Scouts. We were the last nation on earth that kept hunting Nazi war criminals. We tried to do the right thing. My first boss was actually a Nuremberg prosecutor at the bankers' trial, the Nazi bankers. You see, President Roosevelt wanted to put the German bankers on trial so that they would say, but we were only doing what the American bankers asked us to do. And that way, the German bankers at the Nuremberg trial would wipe out the whole funding base of the Republican Party at Wall Street. By some estimates, uh, nearly 70% of the funds that went to build the Third Reich before World War II came from Wall Street. And uh, again, those guys that kept the money flowing and covered it up, that was giving aid and comfort to the enemy in time of war. And my own Justice Department was despicable. We had, uh, I think there were more than 150 Americans from different companies 
who stayed in Nazi Germany during the war to help the Nazis run their companies. And General Motors truck companies, Ford oil companies. And these guys were arrested after the war, kept in a special prison. And they were all released, every one. They never were charged as traitors. They should have been. Absolutely. Absolutely, they should have been. Can you talk about uh, Ashcan and Dustbin and, and the financiers being held there and what happened? Yeah, Ashcan and Dustbin, those were the code names of the very special prison camp where the American and British Nazi collaborators, the traitors, were being kept. Now, there's a buddy of mine, Don Jensen, who's still alive. He's one of the guards of the camp. It was a British camp in the British zone, but it had American guards. So no matter who came nosing around, you could say, well, you're British. This is an American problem. Go away. Or the other way around. Now, one of the guards, Don, uh, when well, he's a young private, uh, turned to one of the Americans and said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm not going to be here long. I work for the Chase Bank. My friends will get me out of here. And Don said, what do you make you so sure they even want to recognize you? <laughs> the man just laughed. Now, the prisoner was right. He was let go. All of them were let go. Um, Ashkin Dustbin was the heart of the cover-up. A lot of, you know, people say, oh, conspiracy theories. There was, this, this was a crime. Ashkin Dustbin was a prison camp that contained American and British collaborators who stayed in Nazi Germany during the war. They should have been put on trial for treason. But putting them on trial would have exposed the Rockefellers, the Walkers, the Bushes, the Harrimans, the Kennedys, and so on. You know? And mind you, Harriman and Bush money was was frozen at one point through the Union Bank, but then they were never prosecuted. And I'm sure there are dozens, if not hundreds, of examples like that, right? Yeah, well, see, Union Bank in New York was run by Prescott Bush. Actually, he was sort of the alcoholic son-in-law. He was dumped on all the boards, but he didn't do much. The evil guy was his father-in-law, Herbert Walker, as in George Herbert Walker Bush. Right. Herbert Walker was the, the real genius that got us involved with the Nazis. So Prescott's in charge of the Union Bank and also some companies that helped Auschwitz, if you can believe it. But there were three banks. There was one in Berlin, one in Amsterdam, one in New York. So no matter which side won World War II, one of the banks would pop up and say, hi, I'm neutral. Give us all our property back. And that's what happened. The Amsterdam Bank popped up and said, oh, those nasty Nazis stole all our corporate property in Germany. Please give it back to us. And the Allies did. So, you know, you don't have to, you know, smuggle the money out and have gold trains. You just have to move pieces of paper to show that, you know, whichever bank you want really owns the property. And that was a very clever theft. That's what happened. They paid off uh, Prince Bernhard of Netherlands, the crown prince. Right. Uh, I guess he made over a billion dollars uh, in this uh, covering up the Nazi money laundering through the Netherlands after the war. See, that's what See? I mean. I'm not trying to connect dots when they're not there, but you've got Prince Bernhard, who later founded the Bilderberg Group, carried so many of these big American financiers, the Europeans as well. And you see the Harrimans from Union Banking, you see the wise men, John J. McCloy, you see George Kennan, all of these people, part of this network that's involved in covering up for the whole Nazi thing. When I interviewed some of these guys, I called up McCloy. He was, uh, I think he just retired as chairman at the Chase National Bank. And I said, look, you were the American High Commissioner of Germany. How in God's name could you pardon these Nazi war criminals who had been convicted at Nuremberg? of financial crimes. And he said, oh, is, is it the request of the Vatican? And I bet it was, you know. Mm -hmm. Now the Vatican wanted to get its money back. Hitler was very clever. Um, there was a big financial settlement with Mussolini and the, and the Pope before World War II. And all that money was stupidly invested in Nazi Germany. So to keep the Vatican quiet about his atrocities during the war, Hitler said, you know, would just dribble the money back to the Vatican. As long as they kept their mouth shut about the killing of the Jews, they'd get their money back. So, um, you know, if you want to talk about cons horrible conspiracies that actually happened, start with the Vatican Bank. I mean, that place is obscene. Um, I, had, I had volunteered to help a group of people sue the Vatican Bank because um, we have documents, American classified files, 
showing, for example, money stolen from Croatian Jews was laundered through Switzerland, through the Vatican Bank, to Nazis in South America. Well, gee, a lot of that money stuck to the Vatican's hands. The Vatican secretly controls some of the largest reinsurance companies. Uh, so, yeah, the, the Vatican became the money launderer of choice. Uh, these guys, by the way, you can't say that it was an ideological conspiracy. Mm -hmm. They tried to fund both Hitler and Stalin. Okay, they didn't care who won. It was all about the money. Sure. sure. <clears throat> so uh, I didn't get to read through your whole book, but I did notice where you brought up Kissinger and uh, how you've had some confrontations with Henry Kissinger over the years, and you've read his files. Tell us uh, what you found out about him. You know, it's funny, uh, Seymour Hirsch was doing a big expose on Henry Kissinger, uh, Price of Power. And just as his book was in galleys, just before it was to be printed, someone at CIA said, how can you do a book about Kissinger without interviewing Loftus? He's the only one who's read all the Kissinger files. And so uh, Hirsch flew up to my law office in Boston and said, well, what do you know about Kissinger? And I said, well, do you want to start with his intelligence background after the war? He said, you mean Kissinger was a spy? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. I can't prove that Henry Kissinger ever recruited Nazis, but I can prove that he worked at every classified file center where the records of the Nazis were stored. Um, and Hirsch was stunned, so I became his secret source, and he added a whole bunch of stuff in the book. And when the book came out, it was a big success. And Henry Kissinger's lawyers called Seymour Hirsch and threatened to sue, and it was all about the Nazi information. And uh, Hirsch called me up and said, and you know what? I told him I, I just got the information from Loftus. <laughs> and they hung up the phone. They never called back. So, yeah, I think Henry Kissinger is one of the worst people in American history. And he's, a, he's a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Uh, yeah, so is <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, can you get more into the Justice Department, their larger role uh, in this and so many other incidences, really working against justice, uh, as you argue in many cases? You know, it was so sad. There was a, a special law that justice set up where the intelligence agencies could bring up to 100 uh, people a year who weren't eligible to get visas to America, let alone become citizens. But the 100 Persons a Year Act uh, was run by the Justice Department. And they brought in like the head of the Ukrainian Gestapo. His name was Mykola Lebed. Guy became a US citizen. And the Justice Department had it covered up because the Attorney General's signature was on the file. So they, the Justice Department told the CIA and President Truman and eventually Congress that Mikola Abed was part of the anti-Nazi resistance. Now here's a guy who murdered Simon Wiesenthal's mother, <laughs> whose Ukrainian Gestapo, called uh, the Shushba Beshba, uh, murdered hundreds of thousands of Jews, Poles, his fellow Ukrainians. This guy was a monster. The Justice Department created a whole fictional biography for the guy. And so here I am, sticking my neck out. I, I, I quit the Justice Department. I go on 60 Minutes. And we had a great time. You know, Congress was outraged. They demanded hearings. Mike Wallace got the Emmy Award. My family got the death threats. Yeah. And when we finally get around the hearings, I, the Justice Department fixed one of the guys, the committee chairman, so that I could not testify in executive session. That meant I couldn't tell any of the classified files. I couldn't tell about Nicola Lebed. It wasn't until recently that I discovered how complete the lies were. So the Justice Department itself bears substantial responsibility for the protection of Nazi war criminals in America and for the entry of senior Nazi war criminals whose visas were personally signed by the Attorney General. So, yeah, a couple of those attorney generals probably should have gone to prison as well. And so everything you saw as part of the larger pattern of the media refusing to report on what's really going on, uh, 
clandestine files can't be opened or reported on. Your book can't get reviewed for 30 years. Justice won't prosecute the people. Uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it to the future in terms of all the criminals working within the system hide behind the National Security Act or hide behind, you know, anything they can use to their advantage, but the whistleblowers like yourself are prevented from coming forward or ignored or how do we fight back against this? Well, you know, the funny thing is, in the long run, the people that classified all this stuff have uh, stuck the dagger in, in their own hearts because sooner or later, all of the files will be declassified. Now, Congress said to the, all these spy agencies, declassify all your Nazi files, and this time has gone by. But one-third of all the Nazi records are still kept in secret vaults. Well, know why? Because there were files that came from the British, and the British rule was 75 years have to elapse before mm. their files could be released. So sometime starting between 2015 and 2025, we're going to see a whole torrent of Nazi files coming out in London and in Washington that are going to shock people. So I just tried to preserve as much as I could so that future historians will be able to find a path of the files, make sense of them, how they work, because these guys left a written record of their crimes. Every time they censored something out of one of my books, it was admitting that what I was saying was true. For example, um, we routinely wiretap all American phone conversations, all of them, every day. It's an electronic vacuum cleaner. And then someone from the British Secret Service sits down at an NSA computer and decides which names to search for. So we can literally pull a conversation out where the word Israel is mentioned and find anyone that's talking about it. Um, but when Congress asks, or the, or the judges ask, you know, both sides can truthfully swear that we aren't spying on our own people, and they're not. Well, the, they're spying on the other guy's people then swapping information. It's an exchange. It's an exchange. The Americans use the GCHQ people computers to spy on the British people. And the British Secret Service uses NSA to spy on the American people. Who needs search warrants? So the Bill of Rights is just, uh, you know, uh, a typo. It doesn't mean anything anymore. And this cover-up has gone on too long. That's got to stop. Uh, and, you know, this whole thing that began with a cover-up of the Nazi money using national security to cover up the movement of Nazi money and the, and the migration of Nazi businessmen. Uh, that's going to haunt the very corporations that uh, began that. Uh, corporations are people in America. Well, we're the only country in the world that treats corporations as people. But people can be executed for their crimes. And I think there's a reasonable chance that when all of these files come out, our kids are going to look at the Rockefeller companies and the Harriman companies and say, you guys don't deserve to be in business. We're going to dissolve your corporations and give the stock to the victims. Um, I think that would be justice. I think it would be financial justice to actually, you know, break up these corporations and sell the pieces, you know, benefit uh, the Veterans Retirement Fund. God knows the but there's a big challenge, too, because the apparatuses they built are offshore. They have loophole after loophole. It's very sophisticated companies they have now. All of them are here in America, and all the evidence is going to show how it worked. Um, you know, it's too late to destroy the files. The guys that did this are dead. Mm -hmm. And their successors in the corporations don't even know where all the pieces fit. So one of the ironies of the classification system is that it has preserved very well uh, the fingerprints of crime and linking back to the corporations in America that made a profit off World War II on the wrong side of the war. It would be very interesting if it all comes out. I wonder what the people would think if, if they ever actually sat down and read it. And I think the people are going to say that we fought World War II to make America safe for Nazi retirement or Rockefeller investments. I think the Republican Party is going to take a big hit. 
Yeah, I, res I respect that you say it's a Republican Party thing, but I, I just don't see it when you see the connections between union banking and between Rockefeller and so many other entities. It, it all looks very integrated to me. At the corporate level, I could see, but, but I see the corporate level pursuing its own agenda. Yeah, I think what you had was a, uh, you know, you had both Democrats and Republicans that had invested in Germany in the 20s and 30s and then panicked and collaborated with Hitler in the 40s and then tried to hide their crimes in the 50s under clouds of national security. And the Dulles brothers who came to power in the Eisenhower administration, um, they, you know, they actually did more harm than good to the investors by classifying their crimes. So yeah, maybe there'll be some justice. Maybe it's too late for justice, but it's not too late for the truth. And if we find out what really happened, you know, with all this, the movement of this money back in the 20s, my God, if these guys could fund Hitler and Stalin and get away with it, what could they be doing now? And I have a pretty good idea what they're doing now. Please tell Please. us. One of the Nazi groups that we funded and protected after World War II were the Arab Nazis. Um, and this was a huge, successful project of the Third Reich, of the Abwehr, the German intelligence service. The, the Muslim Brotherhood was a proxy arm of Nazi intelligence. They were supposed to be an underground army, uh, you know, a half a million secret Nazi members working for the Third Reich. And they did uh, try various coups, for example, in Iraq during World War II that was crushed. But there were Arab Nazis, there were about three quarters of a million of them at war's end. And none of them were ever punished because the British Secret Service guys like Kim Philby and McLean um, made Egypt a safe haven for all the Arab Nazis. They brought them back to Cairo. Even the German officers that ran these programs were given Arab names and converted to Islam. So... The Muslim Brotherhood, though, was a real threat. You know, they, they knocked off the, the king of Egypt, and, uh, and they were a threat when the new uh, secular uh, regime came in the 50s. They were expelled. By then, the Dulles brothers had come to power under their gullible dupe Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. And the Dulles brothers convinced the Saudis to resettle the Muslim Brotherhood, all the Arab Nazis, and put them in Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis said, well, why not? You know, uh, the Saudis were pro-Nazi during World War II. And the Egyptian Nazis, the rest of the Arab Nazis, at least were literate. So the Saudis put them to work as school teachers. And the Arab Nazis became the leaders of the madrasas. You had a perfect storm of Saudi religious bigotry called Wahhabism or Salafism and Nazi racism. Um, young men like Osama bin Laden were literally tutored by Nazis. Um, his personal tutor was the brother of the chief Nazi propagandist for the Muslim Brotherhood. But the idea for the Dulles brothers was that uh, we would keep the Arab Nazi Nazis as a proxy army to fight the Arab communists during the Cold War. And every once in a while, they'd take the Arab Nazis out of the closet for one purpose or another. The last time we took the Arab Nazis out was when Vice President Bush sent them off to Afghanistan to recruit a new generation of freedom fighters. We actually had World War II Arab Nazis coming to America to recruit Mujahideen, the freedom fighters, to go to Afghanistan. Um, we actually built, through the Muslim Brotherhood, a, a separate terrorist organization that was not controlled by CIA, as the conventional wisdom has, or by the U.S. government. It was run by the Saudis and the Pakistanis, but funded with American money. But no one knew the money was going through these old Nazi conduits. And so when the war was over, and America said, oh, we won in Afghanistan, we threw the commies out, we went home and left this huge army of the second generation of Arab Nazis in the field. And, you know, they formed a base, the Arab word for which is Al-Qaeda, okay? Uh, and if you think about it, Al-Qaeda and the Nazis had identical goals. They were against democracy, Britain, America, Western culture, Jews. Um, they are very much second generation Nazis. And one of the reasons we're fighting Al-Qaeda today is because we never 
finish the job against the Arab Nazis after World War II. They were protected first by the British Secret Service and then by the Dulles brothers in their intelligence service. And it's a horror story that's coming back to haunt us. The Muslim Brotherhood has now gained power through the ballot in Egypt and is threatened to uh, overthrow a whole crescent of states that are tending to go Islamist in the next election. So we have Islamist extremists. And please understand, these guys are not about Islam. Um, the Salafists are to Islam as the Ku Klux Klan is to Christianity. And that's why the Nazis only recruited the extreme groups like the Salafis uh, to join the Muslim Brotherhood. So it is wrong to say that this is Islam. Islam is a very pacifistic, genial, sort of very anything goes religion, particularly among the Sufis. Um, but what we have now are in the Muslim Brotherhood is a very well organized group of extreme cultists. Think as if the Ku Klux Klan had taken over Texas. And that's what's happened in Egypt. That's what's going to be happening all across the Middle East. And that's the legacy of the Dulles Brothers. But Mr. 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 Loftus, the whole thing is a tangled web. Uh, we're now partnered with Al-Qaeda in Libya, now in Syria. The whole Arab Spring had a covert uh, Western uprising to it, and yet the power falls to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, how do you explain this channeling of power into the most extremist groups and the continuation of these terrible partnerships? Yeah, again, you know, the, the easy thing is to say, well, it must be a conspiracy. There must be some ideological connection here. And there isn't. Um, I hate to say this, but WikiLeaks does serve one purpose. If, if you go through all the collected WikiLeaks stolen cables and search for Freedom House, okay, you'll get the whole story of what happened. For about 10 years, Democratic and Republican administrations agreed that we had made a mistake in backing the Arab dictators in the Middle East, that sometimes, somehow, we had to make a transition to democracy. Well, during the Clinton administration and carried on the Bush, the idea was, you know, no more talk, let's do it. So we brought young people from all over the Middle East to Washington and trained them on how to use cell phones, the Internet, uh, you know, to organize demonstrations for a peaceful, nonviolent overthrow of their governments. And... You'll see in the WikiLeaks cables that all these kids were told the same thing. All of the uprisings are set to take place in 2011. Now, we thought that if these young people were so capable as to overthrow all these regimes, they would certainly be capable of organizing a political group strong enough to win an election. On that part, we were terribly wrong. Uh, the kids were just incompetent. They only did half the job. And uh, so the Israelis just shake their heads at us and go, how could you guys be so stupid? How could you overthrow the Mubarak regime, but not have a solid, moderate, democratic regime to take its place? Instead, we let the organized groups, the, the second generation Nazis, if you will, who had been organized for a year, they were superbly placed to seize power. We didn't see it coming. Our great intelligence services really dropped the ball on that one. Most of the time, it's 90% stupidity and 10% conspiracy. That's how the world of covert operations actually works. So the Freedom House organization to train young people for a 2011 uprising was a well-intended mistake because they had only planned for the uprising and not for the elections to follow. Uh, a huge mistake, and it may take decades for democracy to regain a foothold after the Arab Spring. You know, uh, groups, these Islamist groups, uh, believe in, you know, one man, one vote, one time. In the Palestinian area, we saw Hamas. Hamas came to power, not because anyone liked them, they had about 20% of the vote normally, but Everyone voted for them because they wanted to get the PLO and Arafat's people out because they'd stolen too much. But once Hamas was in office, they would never allow another election. And to this day, they haven't. Um, I doubt that there will be another Egyptian election. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so we may have created a monster. But the funny thing is, dictatorships and groups like the Muslim Brotherhood only survived and thrived because of illiteracy. And they got away with all this pro-Nazi stuff, you know, during World War II and afterwards because the people were illiterate. Now television and radio and cell phones have changed all that. I mean, the people of Iran, who have been illiterate for years, have just learned that there's oil in their country. They want to know where's all the money going. Uh, so there are more uprisings to come. In the long run, I'm betting that democracy will win, but the Arab Spring was a very clumsy but well-intentioned initiative. Sure. Sure. Now, switching gears, tomorrow is the anniversary of the 7-7 bombings in London. We've got a short clip of you from 2000, well, after 2005 on Fox News, talking about Aswat, supposedly the uh, ringmaster of the attacks, being MI6 agent. Let's roll that clip. They were headed by, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Captain Hook, right. the uh, imam in London, the Finsbury right. Mosque, without the arm. He was the head of that organization. Now, his assistant was a guy named Aswat, Harun Rashid Aswat. Aswat, who they right. picked up, yeah. yeah. Aswat is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London. From the, on the 7-7 and 721, this is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that you, the entire British police are out chasing him, and one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, John. Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim Sheikh said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent, or what? He's a double agent. He's yeah, working we'll for the... So he's Okay, and the clip goes on, but basically the British are protecting him because he's a double agent of some kind. The Americans don't know. They're trying to capture him. But there's the Justice Department. They're interfering again. Uh, they're letting this guy skirt by. What's going on with this case? I know you haven't followed up on it recently. I really haven't either, but it's still part of this larger pattern of why we're so entangled in the Middle East and, and what a tangled web all this stuff seems to be. It, it, it's so hilarious. Here was a guy, Aswat, who was running from country to country, and the CIA would track him down, and they'd say, okay, to the local host country, please arrest him. And all of a sudden, the guy would slip out of their fingers, and the British Secret Service was literally moving him from country to country, one step ahead of the CIA. The British had made a deal with the devil. They had allowed a neutral zone for terrorist groups in the city of London. They could stay there and not be touched, as long as they did all their bombings overseas, then there was no terrorism in London. The French, for example, French intelligence service was furious. They called it Londonistan, but the British had made a, a safe haven for Islamist terrorists. Um, and finally, you know, it, it had to happen eventually. The Islamic extremists turned on the British and began bombings in London. And wouldn't you know, the guy behind it was one of the very people, Aswat, that had worked for the British. There's an American connection, too. Aswat was uh, once sent to America to build up a terrorist base here. And I think it was up in Oregon. And the Justice Department authorized the indictment and arrest of everyone involved except Aswat. The guys above him and below him were on the indictment list. But he was never mentioned. He was just allowed to go free. So uh, it's a lesson in how the world really works. Uh, a lot of people who are involved in the war of terror uh, know that the Justice Department sometimes is on both sides of the war. Uh, we had an operation down here in Tampa where they are laundering uh, stolen vehicles from the United States and the expensive ones were being sent to Kuwait and Qatar to be sold for money for Al-Qaeda. But the eagles were turned into car bombs to kill American soldiers in Iraq. I mean, we had the VIN numbers, everything was traced. And uh, we had a bunch of agencies helping us, uh, Secret Service and Customs and ICE. And the FBI came in and shut it all down. It was just too embarrassing. A lot of the people the FBI had recruited, like Aswat, were double agents. 
you know, right under the nose of the FBI, these guys had been building terrorist networks in America. One of the reasons the FBI didn't share information with the CIA and other agencies was because it was too embarrassing. There was one guy here in Tampa, uh, Professor Samuel Arian. Everyone thought of him as a nice, genial Muslim professor, leader of the Muslim Students Organization. And um, my friends were telling me that uh, he was one of the world leaders of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Islamic Jihad is the most violent terrorist group uh, in, in Palestine, perhaps in the Middle East. And uh, he was ahead of it. And we had videotapes of uh, Professor El Aryan out of these fundraiser meetings, you know. Who will give me $500 to kill a Jew? I tell you, this money is only for killing Jews, not for our administration. So uh, what I did was I donated ten dollars to Professor Al Arian's charities and then sued him under Florida law to see where my money was going. Was it going for a charitable purpose or was it going for terrorism? Well what happened is my complaint listed all of the classified information I'd been given access to mm-hmm. and exposed Al Arian as one of the worst terrorists in the world. And uh, you know, local newspapers couldn't believe it. This was sweet Sammy. And it, it turns out I was right. He really was a major terrorist. But uh, He isn't in jail. He's just sitting up uh, at his daughter's house uh, with one of those ankle bracelet things on. Uh, He's supposed to be charged with criminal contempt unless he tells the grand jury exactly how he got the money. But his lawyers say he's afraid to because he knows he'll be killed. And he may be right on that point. The money came, was laundered through Saudi extremists. They had a whole network of places set up at 500 uh, Herndon Road, uh, uh, certain Road in Herndon, Virginia. So, uh, you know, 10 minutes after I filed my lawsuit against El Arian, the Justice Department finally raided the exact address, Operation Green Quest. And so at least in one hour, I closed down all the Saudi money laundering uh, networks in America. But yeah, the Justice Department has been protecting the Saudis. We've been on both sides of the war against terror. That nonsense has to stop. Now, uh, today we have Eric Holder in the Fast and Furious controversy. He's been found in contempt of Congress. Uh, is this probably the most public shame moment for the uh, Justice Department and the Attorney General? Uh, what do you make of the whole Eric Holder Fast and Furious case, and, and what does it mean for the larger Justice Department? As much as I dislike Eric Holder, he gets a green light on Fast and Furious. There is no evidence whatsoever that he even knew about it. This was started under a previous Attorney General of the Bush administration. Um, But the Justice Department is saying, look, you can't see our internal correspondence. That's executive privilege. Uh, I think it's a big mistake that there should be no executive privilege where a crime is suspected. Now, I know that this time on Fast and Furious, it's nothing more than a political stunt by the Republicans in the House of Representatives. And shame on them for doing it. But... uh, I think that we should start looking behind executive privilege where clear and convincing evidence exists that the Justice Department itself may have participated in a crime under previous administrations because the same rule would apply, should have applied to the Justice Department back when they were bringing Nazis into America. That was illegal too, but they never got touched. Right, but that was the the thing with the gun walking was that Issa kind of brought out in the hearings that it was going on during Bush, and then suddenly they didn't want to talk about that anymore. And it's kind of that whole uh, Iran-Contra pattern, and something tells me it just goes on and on. Yeah, Issa now has backed off. He said, well, yeah, there really is no evidence that Holder knew. But we'd like to see the files anyway. Well, you can't have fishing expeditions. But yeah, Issa has now... uh, backed off remarkably, because it looked like most of the evidence was going to point at Bush. I mean, George Bush was just this nice, genial guy who didn't have a clue. And the people around him did far more damage to this country than they realized. A lot of nice people in the Republican Party, but uh, their leadership has sold us out. Do you think the wiretaps are going to change the questions about Holder, prove that he knew more than than we think he knows at this point? I don't think that Holder knew. Yeah. Yeah. And, and nobody, none of my sources have said anything to me 
to indicate that. This was just, you know, a good example of a bad example. The House shouldn't have made this an issue. It was oh. fighting the wrong battle at the wrong time. What it do you think about the larger gun walking issue and the larger uh, networks of guns trading for money, trading for drugs, and all this stuff? Oh, I think it's asinine. These things always get out of control, whether it's the DEA doing it or CIA. When you are giving aid and comfort to criminal organizations, somebody has to be looking over the shoulder from outside the agency and say, no, wait a minute, guys. You know, come up to reality for a second. You, you know, one gun, maybe. 20,000 guns? Absolutely not. So... uh you know, that, that thing should have been scaled back right away. Uh, but there is very little supervision on covert agents. That's how Nazis got to be recruited for the intelligence service. Okay, final okay. question. What do you think is the best reform issue we can have with the clandestine issues, how these things get nested so secretly in the whole larger workings of national security, which obviously serves an important purpose? Uh, what What is kind of the main issue we should be looking at as we hope to maybe change the system for the better in the years to come? we get two options. You can either have a South African-style truth commission where everybody gets a wash. I think the simplest thing is that Obama, if he's reelected, should just pardon everyone who, within the executive branch, who committed a crime or knew of a crime on the condition that they tell about all the other crimes that they had knowledge of. Can you imagine what would happen if the defense contractors all of a sudden had all the uh, Defense Department employees saying, yeah, I took a bribe from this company? It would break the back of corporate influence uh, in, inside the, uh, the executive branch. Uh, it's time that something very simple and very drastic should be done. It's way too late for justice, but maybe it's not too late for the truth. I would like to have these people come forward and say, yeah, yeah, we did it. It was stupid. It was wrong. At least we stand a chance of rescuing the next generation from the crimes that we failed to prevent. Let's hope Let's so. Hope. I didn't properly p plug your book, but it's excellent. It's a very interesting topic, America's Nazi Secret. We have it at InfoWars, but tell us just briefly how it's part of this larger project, part of the Belarus secret, how that was shut down. And then finally, tell us where we could find your work, your website. Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't have a website right now. I've just been recovering from a series of back operations. Sure. Never jump out of a perfectly good airplane. I wasn't <laughs> Um, but the book is um, everything that was censored out of my books over the last 30 years. After 30 years, the time clock expires. And CIA sent me a letter saying I don't have to submit my books for censorship anymore. I said, great. So the first thing I wrote about was all the things that CIA and Justice had censored out of my books in the last 30 years. And it gives you a real good idea. I used the, the Belarus, um, the Belarusian Nazis as an example, sort of a case study sure, in how sure. the system works and how the cover-up can continue. And uh, I wish that, in hindsight, that I'd focus more on the Arab Nazis than the Belarusian Nazis because of their current uh, advance. But, you know, I've written some pretty good books. Um, the Secret War Against the Jews is a history of covert operations against Israel. And it really is about the influence of oil money and oil power in world politics. That's the secret war against the Jews. Unholy Trinity was about the Vatican, the Nazis, and the Swiss banks. The first book, The Belarus Secret, that became America's Nazi secret, was sort of a, a case study in, in how the lies take place. Well, John Loftus, I know you're a contributor on a lot of networks. I hope we can get you on again in the future because there's so much interesting things in history. It's so complex. Obviously, we can't tackle it all in one day, but it's just it's mind-blowingly interesting. Oh, it's, it's a fascinating subject, but history doesn't belong to the Republicans or the Democrats, to the left or the right. History belongs to us. And it is what it is. If, we, if America's made mistakes, let's admit it, understand it, and move on. That's what history should be about. George Orwell said that the most powerful form of lie is the omission. 
And it's the duty of the historian to ensure that those lies don't creep into the history books. Well, I'm a former prosecutor and that's what I'm about. I'm trying to make sure in my new career as a historian that we keep the lies from getting passed on to the next generation. Well said and well quoted. Thanks very much for joining us. And that is not all for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. We now have a special video presentation. It's one of the most important videos you're ever going to see. I've been working on it with Alex for the past two weeks, and we really try to touch on humanity as a whole, where we've come from, and where we're going, and the big challenges we have to face in the future. Stay tuned. That's coming up right now. For now, that's all for the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dykes. The mysteries of the universe, the age-old questions, where did humankind come from? What is our ultimate destiny? The answers to these fundamental questions are hiding in plain view. We came from the universe. We came from all that is creation. We are part of the universe. We come out of this creation. The answer to the question of our existence is wonderment. The planet Earth is home to our species, orbiting a standard sun, two-thirds of the way out on the spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy. Here you see a super galaxy, a cluster of galaxies. Each one of these a galaxy on its own. Hundreds of billions photographed by Hubble. And Hubble isn't even getting out of our backyard. We are in the middle of wonderment, the middle of incredible creation. Humanity has not even dreamed or the mind imagined the potential of our species. People say they want to travel to space as if it's some distant place when we are part of the universe living on an incredibly rich and gorgeous planet. In the middle of a universe with hundreds and hundreds of billions of photographed galaxies themselves containing hundreds of billions of stars and planetary systems very similar to our own. Our planet is like a grain of sand at an endless beach. But still, despite the fact that it's so tiny, all of our species history has taken place on this globe. All the kings, all the tyrants, the heroes, the families, the little children, the discoveries, the passions that were felt, all of those experiences have taken place here on this planet. And though our individual lives are finite, we are connected to our ancestors and their discoveries, their triumphs, their misfortunes. And we reach forward into the future towards our future progeny. And as long as our species is not destroyed, we truly live forever. Of the countless species that have swum in the earth seas, flown in the sky, crawled across the plains, humanity is undoubtedly superior to them all. But that doesn't mean that we'll always be here. Hundreds of thousands of species have lived on this planet, sometimes for millions of years before their species disappears, often suddenly. All we're left with is their fossils, snapshots, shadows of what they were. Look at this fantastic fossilized dinosaur skull. Was it the inspiration for the space jockey in Prometheus? Truth is stranger than fiction. All of the thousands and thousands of fantastic species, humanity needs to understand that our existence is just as fragile. Scientists hotly debate whether it was a meteorite, a comet, or other outside threat that destroyed the dinosaurs. With humans, our main threat is ourselves. We've had the power to do it for more than 60 years. And every day we see different scientific installations having disasters. We are the equivalent of gods to Stone Age men. And we can't afford to make the mistakes they made because we will destroy ourselves with the technologies that we have developed. So far in our history, technology has been neutral. It is a promising tool that could allow us to grasp an infinite future. But at this time, the entire development of these systems is in the hands of the globalist, super predators who have a lustful disdain and hate for humanity. 
Globalist social engineers openly talk about the population of the planet like we're little animals in petri dishes to be manipulated, to be controlled, to be tested upon. Foster children and U.S. military personnel have had chemicals, biologicals, and radiologicals tested on them for more than 60 years because the elite believe that they're nothing but unconscious animals. I'm asking humanity to realize that a very small group of inbred, unhappy, twisted, and wicked people have seized control of human development and are attempting to establish a total control system of technocratic surveillance and dehumanization. It is now that we must begin to struggle against their bureaucracy, fighting their 1984 system with liberty and freedom and enlightenment and truth. Until the levers of technological development are leveraged from the hands of the globalist, humanity has a very dark future. The real threats facing humanity are not the fake environmental threats that Al Gore and the UN bring you. They are unchecked cross-species genetic engineering. Tens of thousands of biotech companies, universities and governments randomly splicing viruses, bacteria from plants and animals and then injecting them into other animals. This is already giving rise to mutated viruses and bacteria and a irrevocable vandalization of the genetic code of the planet. High-tech chemical and most importantly biological weapons development. Unchecked nanotech, the artificial creation of black holes, antimatter weapons that the Air Force admits they've developed, and new viral vaccines coming out that re-engineer the brain by attacking certain ganglia systems so that you can no longer feel emotions. We've seen one of the biggest mutual funds, Fidelity Investments, come out and talk about synthetic biology. Within 50 years, we may have invented more organisms in the lab than we've identified in nature. It's synthetic biology, and it could be the defining technology of the 21st century. And how within just a few years, they're gonna overwrite every major life form on this planet without asking you. That's a trillion times what Monsanto does, planting their crops next to yours. Their crops then infect your crops, and they come and charge you with copyright infringement when they polluted your property. All of this is being rolled out now. We are under a massive and sustained offensive by the technocratic psychopath guild known as the New World Order to fully dominate and wipe out most of humanity so they can control the next phase of our development. The United Nations, Ray Kurzweil, all of these different transhumanists openly say that they're not giving anybody a choice, that they're going ahead in this attempt to evolve humans and merge us with machines. We intend to create a new vector for civilization, aimed at constant human development and evolution. The brain is transplanted into an avatar B. Man receives new, expanded life. The era of neo-humanity. And they believe that they know what the outcome is going to be without even having a public discussion. They believe that they govern the future evolution, as they call it, of our species. That's why we're doing this news report, in the hope that people will look up from the dirt and the television programs and sitcoms and football games that don't matter, that are put there to distract you from the real world, the whole universe going on around you, so that we can have a real debate as a species about our future. And see that there is an entire universe around you of ideas, and that we can chart our future. We can chart our future. Can chart our future. If we don't respect our species, if we forget our ancestors and the lessons they taught us, and if we don't learn from the struggles they went through, we're not gonna survive as a species. You see, we as humans have this instinctive feeling that we've been here forever. When we read the writings of Plato, written more than 2,000 years ago, or William Shakespeare 500 years ago, their words are spoken alive in our minds. This is communicating with people in the past. And like electricity, it gives us a clear connection to them and the present towards the future. That, my friends, is magic. And that's why our species is timeless. Why have all human societies going back thousands of years scraped their names on tree trunks or on cave walls? 
because there is a fundamental human need to communicate forward into the future. It's ingrained in us to teach those that come after us the experiences we had so that they don't relive the mistakes that we made. And so they will learn from the good things that we discovered. We communally share in the knowledge that our species has developed. This is what's different about mankind versus all the hundreds of thousands of species that have come and gone on this planet in its ancient history. We are able to change our environment. We are able to grasp that we're finite. And we are able to construct systems and languages and sciences of mathematics just as we can decipher the hieroglyphs in Egyptian caves and know what they were thinking 4,000 years ago. We can go back 500 years ago to William Shakespeare and his play Macbeth, where Macbeth is out burying a friend. They accidentally in the graveyard dig up his old charge, the jester that took care of him. And Macbeth looks in where the eyes once were at the brow ridges and says, my friend, the one that told me so many jokes, the one who carried me on his shoulders a thousand times. How could it be? You were, you were there full of life and everything and you're gone. You're gone forever. But he's not really gone forever because just as William Shakespeare's words continue on, your knowledge, discoveries you make are passed on. That's what's so amazing about humanity. We can argue all day if there's life after death, but I know one thing, we're alive and sentient right now, and ideas that we develop, art that we create, lives on forever. And even if you don't believe in God, look at the beauty and the majesty of the universe. The universe doesn't make junk. And so don't ever think you're garbage. Don't ever let the system make you feel insecure and hollow inside, hoping that you never advance in your hierarchy of needs. They want to keep you stunted while they live and we sleep. While they are conscious, while we are in a dream state. The planet's social engineers openly talk about us as animals and they see the society they've constructed as an artificial habitat meant to keep us from ever discovering the wider real world. It's time to really get outside the box. It's time to realize the wonder that's all around you. If we go back to the Greek philosopher more than 2,000 years ago, Plato, he wrote a allegory or an analogy of people chained inside a cave. Their only reality is images dancing on a wall, a puppet show in front of a fire. And one of them is able to break out and go up to the surface and sees deer and the sun and the moon and the whole world and tries to come back and warn people. And they say, hey, shut up. We've got a lot invested in this mirage. We want the mirage, not the real thing out there. It is our job to try to break people out of this matrix and to see how incredible and magical this universe and this world is. And to realize that we have value, we're special. What do we see through the controlled corporate media? That humanity's a disease, that the world would be better off without us. Too many kids are what's making the planet worse. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. It looks like you've got a case of the humans. Bad humans. They multiply over 300,000 a day, consuming anything that crosses their path. The establishment is preparing us with a psychological race consciousness memory that we're trash and that we're bad and that we shouldn't have a survival instinct. Earth is just the start. Who knows what's next? They are openly preparing to release biological weapons to reduce the population. This is the real development, not sitcoms on television. The real world is going on around you while you're turning your life over to a television that is literally programming you. Think about what the social engineers feed us. Every television ad, every big blockbuster film has messages crammed into it. You have men going and fantasizing that only Batman or the Incredible Hulk could defeat threats, not the average person. That sports icons are all that matters. 
and that we're all basically garbage and only this Madison Avenue Hollywood system matters when it is only a tiny part of the overall spectrum of life going on on this planet. And it's a facsimile. It's a prosthesis. It's a fake. It's a fraud. Consciousness is unspeakably incredible. The real world is an infinity more valuable and fulfilling than the fraud that is mainline television and all of these films and this dumbed-down culture that seeks to keep you shuttered inside the cave to make you feel small and to make you feel like you need the images they project on the wall more than you need the real world waiting right up those steps on the surface. And even when you make it to the surface out of the cave, you're only here on this planet and outside of it is the larger cave. And still more. You must leave one box and then leave another and still leave another. This is the human experience. This is the electric magic and the wonderment of consciousness and being awake. The doors to the universe and the things we can't even imagine are standing open to us. Don't let their false paradigms and false roadmaps be injected like viruses into your mind. The dreams of your ancestors, the dreams of the universe, the dreams of everything wholesome and good flows like living water out of the space-time continuum. Beauty is all around us. The wind in the trees in the summer, the sunrise, moon set, the ocean, seagulls. When you were a child spraying a water hose up into the sky and looking at the droplets like they were jewels in the air, your children, your grandmother, your grandfather, feeling that first gust of autumn wind on your cheeks, looking up and seeing the stars at night. Everything is a miracle. The fact that you can recognize beauty, the fact that you know when something is wholesome and good, shows that you recognize what is beautiful and wholesome in the universe. You resonate with the good. You recoil from the bad. And because the bad seizes control of the power structures so that it can unnaturally thrive and operate, you pull back saying, ooh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to resist them. But by doing that, you turn the world and the universe over to evil. We cannot allow the planet Earth to become a beachhead of the satanic forces that have bred here. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And there is incredible beauty and creation and power and mission and destiny on this planet. This is an amazing place. And that's why the forces of evil are here as well. And we are in a struggle, not just for this planet, but in the universe around us. Think how far humanity has come in the last 6,000 years. Think of where we could go. As the Bible says, the ear has not heard, the eye has not seen what is in store for us. We are at the jump point for our civilization, for our species. Everything we do now will govern the future of human development forever. Humanity is only in an embryonic phase now. If we're able to continue our development, we are made in the image of the creator of the universe. We are creators. We are powerful. But now we've got to face the predators of our own species and the computers we've created in the final battle to decide if humanity will move to the next level, a type one civilization. And what is a type one civilization? A type one civilization can survive even if its home world is destroyed. That should be the prime goal of Homo sapiens sapien. What do you think your ancestors, if they could look into our dimension and our time today, would want? They would want us to survive and thrive and move into the future. That's all past generations wanted was for their children and progeny and their clan to live. That's the basic human imperative. And to do that, you've got to develop technologies, you've got to be passionate, you've got to be truthful, you've got to build, you've got to be strong. That is the launch pad for the next level of human development. So that's the question. Will we become extinct like so many other species? We can go to space, we can create computers, we can theoritize quantum mechanics. 
Picasso, Beethoven, can we take control of our destiny? Can we have a species-wide debate about our system? Or is death of humankind all that's waiting in our future? That decision, to a great extent, depends on you. So the ball is in your court.